racing one more time. Coming out of four. Down the front stretch. It's a drag race. Marco Andretti, Hornish, who's going to win? At the strike. It's Hornish. Hornish wins. As air flows under an Indy car, a lift force is created, similar to a wing on an airplane. To combat these forces and prevent the car from becoming airborne, Indy cars are equipped with front and back wings as well as venturi tunnels. As the air flow hits the wings, they push the car down, creating downforce. The shape of an Indy car determines its aerodynamics. Aerodynamics is a sum of all forces acting on the car. Calculus is very important when finding aerodynamics since there are so many different curves on the body of an Indy car. However, they can be summed up in the equation force equals the sum of pressure times area times the normal direction. The wings and tunnels on the car form an aerodynamic shape that pierces through the air. If an Indy car catches too much airflow underneath, the lift forces will send the car in the air like a kite, resulting in very dangerous accidents. As it is uh, right down low with Dan Weldon, Dario and Danica on the high side. And here comes Marco. Oh, oh look out! Airport! Frankini's upside down! Dixon is involved! The wheels touched! Weldon is involved! Not only do Venturi tunnels create downforce, they also create an area of low pressure. This low pressure creates suction that allows cars to reach speeds of up to 230 miles per hour and stay attached to the track. In 1911, the quest for speed and horsepower began. In the inaugural Indy 500, Ray Haroon finished first with an average speed of 74.6 miles per hour. IndyCar continued to evolve, becoming faster and more advanced. In 1996, IndyCars reached their peak. Ari Leyendijk set the Indianapolis Motor Speedway track record with a speed of 237.498 miles per hour. Five days later, Scott Brayton was killed during practice. IndyCar officials realized that the sport was becoming too dangerous. After that season, they banned turbocharged engines. Speeds dropped off after 1997, and Ed Carpenter qualified last year for pole with an average speed of 228.762 miles per hour. Horsepower is estimated using torque. Torque is the force that causes an object to rotate. Rotation in the wheels of the car is what causes it to accelerate. Torque can be measured by multiplying force times distance. To find torque in an Indy car, they must use a dynamometer that measures mechanical force. The dynamometer measures the amount of torque exerted by an engine at a set amount of revolutions per minute. The revolution limit set on Indy cars is 10,700. At 10,700 RPMs, an Indy car exerts 319 pounds of torque. Using the equation horsepower equals torque times RPM divided by 5,252, we can determine that a modern Indy car has 650 horsepower. Friction is everywhere in IndyCar. In a bank turn, friction keeps the car from sliding down towards the infield. Friction is also found in the brakes. To slow down, brake pads apply friction to the wheels, and the friction slows down the revolution of the wheel. A car can spin out if friction can't stop the rear of the car from sliding up. The force of friction is calculated by multiplying the coefficient of either static or kinetic friction by the normal force. The normal force is the equal and opposite force to gravity. Friction tears up the Firestone tires on an Indy car 
and so they must swap their tires out every once in a while during a pit stop. Friction also comes in effect on pit lane. Pit boxes are made of cement because the coefficient of kinetic friction is higher and allows a car to stop more quickly. The product of friction acting on the tires is what drivers call marbles. Marbles are pieces of rubber that friction in the track have torn off the tire. The marbles are pushed towards the top of the track. If a car comes in contact with marbles, they could crash. A G-force stands for the force of gravity acting on the human body. 1 G equals 9.8 meters per second, which is the same as the force of Earth's gravity. Humans can survive a high amount of G-forces for a split second. For example, a slap to the face produces around 100 Gs of force. Continued forces above 10 Gs can be lethal. During an IndyCar race, Drivers can experience up to 4 G's while driving at speeds above 200 miles per hour for 3 hours. In 2003, Kenny Brack survived one of IndyCar's biggest accidents. Inside the cockpit, it was recorded he experienced up to 214 G's, and amazingly, he survived. This was the highest amount of G's ever recorded in an IndyCar impact. To make this all happen, he's got to be thinking inside his cockpit right now. Oh, the big play! Major, major incident. Kenny Breck getting way high. The weight of an Indy car can simply be found by multiplying mass by gravity. A car can stop more quickly if it is lighter. Lighter cars will also turn much easier. An Indy car weighs between 1,500 and 1,600 pounds. It costs between one to seven million dollars. Here he comes, the National Guard machine with J.R. Hildebrand down along the white line. He is sputtering slow and he hits the wall. He hits the wall coming out of four. Will he have enough to cross the yard of bricks? Here it comes. Here comes J.R. Hildebrand. He will cross in front of the flag stand with the checkered flag waving the right side of the car destroyed. He finishes the race with the damaged race car. Who will win? Who is the winner? Weldon. Dan Weldon. Dan Weldon has won the race.